The purpose of this course is to show you how to, well, show, I'm not sure is the right word, is to enable you to make your own computer music applications in, in the sense of designing electronic music instruments. Uh, what that means, in a sense, is making your computer do what a guitar or a, or a drum set does when you do things to it, so that you have, uh, the thing is running in real time, it's making sound, and you walk up to it and do things to it and that changes the sound that it makes. For instance, it might be silent until you start doing something and then it starts making noise and then you've got an instrument that does, you know, that does something in response to how you're trying to get it to do things. So, um, this is a particular, this, this thing, this, this idea of using computers to make computer music instruments is in some sense sort of the trunk of the whole field of computer music, at least the way I see it. Uh, computer music grew out of, or maybe as part of, a, of the field which could be called electronic music, which started, depending on how you think of it, maybe in the late 1900s, maybe in, sorry, 1800s, maybe in 1948 when the first tape recorder music started getting made. Um, may, well, you could put other kinds of dates on it. And the, the whole field of electronic music is basically people inventing ways of making music with, with electronic gear, as opposed to acoustic instruments. Um, it wasn't obvious for, at, at first when computers showed up on the scene, that computers would eventually essentially supplant all, uh, all of the other electronic musical instruments that exist, which means the tape recorder, the um, synthesizer, the, all that kind of stuff. And, but nowadays, uh, everything that you could have found in, a, in an electronic music studio in the 50s or 60s or the 90s, uh, is, is a piece of software on the screen of your computer with a couple of very important provisos. Uh, proviso number one is that a computer makes a rotten musical instrument in the sense that you can't strum it or whap it or any of those good things that you can do with acoustic instruments. And I'm not going to do a whole lot of, of talking about designing hardware interfaces for making computers and, uh, respond more naturally to musical impulses. Um, the reason I'm not going to talk about that is because it's its own subject and it's also a rather various subject. Different people have completely different approaches to, to designing interfaces to computers. And so it's such a wide, disorganized field that there's, it's hard to figure out how to make a syllabus out of it in the first place. So I'm just going to sort of ignore that. And to the extent that I need to, to actuate my computer, I'm going to be using keyboards and the mouse and the microphone. Um, all right, so that's, so, so other than that aspect of just getting inputs into the computer, I think that everything that you that you do now in electronic music you at least can do with a computer. Um, so a couple of things about that. Okay, first off, what is what does making music with computers split up into as a you know as a as a set of things that you can do? Uh, and my my own taxonomy of, of what you do with computers to make them into computer music instruments are that there are really three basic things that you might want to know how to do. One is synthesize sounds. What that means is, um, at least what that means to me, is that you write down an algebraic equation and um, it, has the, it has a variable in it for time. And then as time passes, you just plug different numbers into the time slot and out comes a sinusoid or, or whatever it is that you told the equation to make. And then you get to hear it, right? And if you came up studying mathematics like I did, this is paradise, right? Because you, uh, any equation you can think of, you can listen to it. Okay, so that's synthesis, synth synthesizing sound, and that comes out of a long tradition of making stuff like oscillators and, and filters that, um, uh, that have existed for at least 100 years for, for doing that before computers really came on the computer music scene. Uh, a second thing is what I think people usually call either processing or signal processing. Uh, which is kind of a misnomer because signal processing means many other things besides what it means to computer musicians. But at least if you're in a room with computer musicians in it, when someone says signal processing, what they tend to mean is something that takes a sound in and changes it into something else to, to go out. Um, the simplest example of that, or sorry, the most ubiquitous example of that, I think, is sampling where you take a microphone up to something and make a recording, and then you have a button that, pre that you press that plays it back. And the only transformation is that you heard it at a different time from when you recorded it. That's a perfectly good transformation. Right? And in chapter seven, I think it is, you will find all sorts of things to do with that particular kind of transformation. 
Okay, so that's item number two. One was synthesis, two is, is signal processing. And three is analysis, the idea of taking a sound that goes in and boiling it down to a set of parameters that describes what that sound is, as in, or some aspect of what that sound is. So a very simple example of that is a, an envelope follower which, um, which will tell you whether someone started playing an instrument or not, or more generally tell you whether there seems to be sound coming into a microphone right now or, or not. And you would use that, for instance, if you wanted to, for instance, if you wanted to find out if someone was walking into the room so you could turn the lights on automatically. Put up a microphone, hook it into an envelope follower, and then have it turn the lights on when the amplitude of the sound reaches a certain level. So that's analysis. And that doesn't sound as interesting as synthesis or processing because there's no sound output. There's just sound input. But um, I hope you'll find out that there's a whole world of cool stuff you can do with that as well. So um, in terms of sort of middle block diagrams, if you want to think about what this all means, synthesis is you have a box and it has an output, but the input was something that isn't sound, the output is sound. Uh, analysis is you have a box and it has a sound input but not an output, and then processing is, the, is a thing where you have both input and output. And what I'm going to do to start with is start with synthesis because it's the easiest thing to get your computers to do. Why? Because it, um, it's much easier to deal with speakers than it is to deal with microphones for reasons that I don't really understand very well. Um, but I want to give you some time to get used to how to how to get your microphones and your computers to be friends. And that might make it more, more appropriate to wait a few weeks before, or you know, however many weeks we can afford to wait before we start doing that kind of thing. Um, and just to make the gesture, I didn't bring a microphone today, although there will be microphones in the room later on. Um, what do I have to tell you? I have to tell you some organizational things about the course that, um, that are boring, but that you need to know. Um, the, there's a website, and the website tells you all the boring stuff that you need to know about the course. The, the website will somewhat change in time. Um, and what it does now is it tells you week by week what I believe the topic is uh, to be that, that this course will consist of. And most of the time, I'm actually able to do what I was planning to do, but sometimes it has to change for one reason or another. So this, this is not a guarantee that this is what we're going to manage to do, but hopefully it's what we'll do. Um, and the, uh, what you'll find is that as the quarter drags on, there are going to be a certain number of assignments, which are things that you have to do with a computer that demonstrate that you have mastered one or another um, technique lit that, uh, that is the topic of the week. Um, this will, uh, the first one of these is due uh, a week from Thursday. That's to say Thursday of week two. And that is a tight deadline. The assignment itself is, is very simple, I hope. Uh, but what that requires you to do is get software loaded into your computer and figure out how to deal with the mechanism for turning homework in, which you probably know better than I do. But leave time to figure all this stuff out. What this means is that you should be you should be doing this right now, so that um, uh, so that when it, when things start going wrong, you can ask for help and, and you can try to figure out what to do to get things to work for you. Um, to that end, there are office hours. Uh, both uh, Joe, the teaching assistant, and I will have office hours on Tuesday because the homeworks will be due on Thursdays. Thinking that that's the most effective way of running it, and so um, Joe will be on. Joe will be here, but I'm not sure in what room yet. It's the room number I think might be changing, but he will be here from two to three on Tuesdays, and I will be here after classes on Tuesday, which will be I'll find everyone nice and exhausted. But anyway, that's another possible way to find out what's going on. <coughs> the okay, so the course has uh, the course has a textbook, sort of. The, um, the textbook is where did I put it? Textbook is online, and it doesn't look like a book, but here's a PDF version, a postscript version, and then there's a nice HTML version, and you can even download a nice tarball with the HTML version, and you can download all the examples that are described in the book, which are patches in PD, 
Or you can download, don't do this, download all the figures in the book, which are also patches in PD. If you really want to laugh at what PD can do, and be hard to do with. Okay. Um, so that, that is textbook, and what I'm going to try to do, although I've been, yeah. What's the website? What's the, oh, what's the website? The URL is here. Oh, yeah, there. And that's a URL you want, although you can get there very easily because you Google Pucket and then you see courses and then you see the first one is Music 171. And I didn't want to insult your intelligences by printing out the syllabus. <laughs> if you really, you know, well, actually, if you have trouble accessing the web, come see me and I'll print you out. But it won't help you so much because it's going to change. Um, on that subject, I want to not forget to say one thing, which is if you don't have easy access to a computer and or the network, please come see me after class today so that we can figure out how to get that solved. Um, there are various things that we can do to try to get you to a computer. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be yet because we'll just have to do it case by case, but the, the polls say that 99% of students now have computers, so I'm going to assume that you do until you tell me that you don't, and if you don't do, please come tell me because otherwise we'll be in serious trouble. <laughs> and, and it is fixable. Okay. Uh, Okay, so, that, so that's the, where's the web page? The, the next thing, this is what you know more about than I do. Um, the system for turning in assignments is WebCT, which probably all of you have suffered through, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I last touched this in 2004 and it was a real error. I think they've made it a little better now. It's actually better than anything else that I've seen. The, the reason it has to exist at all as opposed to just sort of having everyone put homework up on a wiki, is because legally we're not allowed to let other people see your homework assignments. So the whole thing is basically just to protect confidentiality as far as I can tell. There's no other reason to have all this infrastructure. You should, oh, in fact, I would love if one of you would try this. Um, so one of you who actually is online, if you could actually go to WebCT and see if you can log into the course. So this is the WebCT login. Actually, I think you do, oh yeah, you do webct.ucsd.edu. And then, this is, it's not going to do this for you. It's not showing, it's, it it's it's not showing up. Not showing up. Yeah. Yeah. In what sense? This, in, after you log in, it tells you what classes you have that have a WebCT, it's not on that page. And you don't have 171 as one of your classes. Yes. Okay. I was worried about that because I asked for the class roster and I got not a single student in it. <laughs> Um, and I have a call into WebCT to ask them if there's something that I should have been doing that I haven't done yet, which is probably going to turn out to be case. Okay, so this is not going to be a, I mean, sorry, this is not going to be an urgent issue until a week from Thursday when it's time to actually upload stuff because I'm not using WebCT to make stuff available to you. I'm just using it to collect stuff. So for this week, the thing that really is urgent is another thing that I hope some of you will try because maybe this will fail too. Um, <laughs> which is, uh, see if you can download PD and get it to run. And this is going to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit less obvious because um, I'm going to have to show you some things before you can find out whether you're even successfully running PD. Okay, so go back and say something I didn't say. There is a software package that you'll be using for the course, which is Pure Data or PD, and you get it from my website. Uh, and that's and it will run on your computer unless you have something really strange. <laughs> it will even run on your iPhone, but that version of it is not on my website. For that one, I'll tell you if you care. And you can run on Android too, so you can have a lot of fun with this. But right now, we're just going to be using a standard old computer making things easy. Um, and so to do that, you do this. Or there are several things you can do. I'm going to show you what I would normally do, but that your mileage may vary. So um, go grab, oh right, the link is on the website. <coughs> Although you can also find this through my home page if you want to do that. And there's all this good stuff. And here is pure data. 
And you can be conservative and use version 42, which works. Or you can have fun and use version 43, which sort of works. <laughs> but, which, but which does all sorts of new stuff. Um, yeah, and when that, okay, there's one thing I know that doesn't work in 43, which you're not going to get for another week, so I will try to fix that by the time you get it. And anyway, I'll tell you what it is when I can, which is when I've told you what the object is that's going to work right. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to be using 43, I think. Um, oh, in fact, let's just do this. Um, we're going to, okay, so, if you, uh, if you have, a Macintosh that's more than six years old, you will want this funny version. And otherwise, you will want one of these Mac OS X. Um, actually, could I ask for a show of hands? This is just out of curiosity. Well, actually, it matters somewhat, but mostly curiosity. How many of you have as your primary computer a Macintosh? Wow. <laughs> okay. how, many, how many of you have as a primary computer a PC running Windows software? Okay, so maybe 80 to 20, something like that. And how many of you are running something else? One, two, three. Okay. Very good. All right, the reason I brought the Macintosh today, actually there are two reasons. The, the honest reason is that um, it, uh, my Linux box doesn't have DVI out. So, so I'm kind of stuck right now on incompatibility mode. Uh, the other reason is that I want to look like you guys are looking today, but then by Thursday you're going to be watching me play with Linux instead of OS X. So all the OS X lore, unless I decide really to punish you for the PC. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, no promises about that. Okay, so, um, so we're going to be Macintosh today. And we're going to grab PD, the, the, the scary one, and I think... Let's just tell it. All right, let's do that. I don't know. <laughs> I usually save it and then I get into a shell and I, then I type tar space x z f space blah blah. And you probably don't want to know how to do that, so I'm going to try to pretend I'm a regular computer user. One of you is trying this, right? So that you can see if it's actually works for you too. For now. What did it do? Double click the. This? But that's yeah, the thing I just. I thought it opened. No, 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 no. See, I just did that. Or it did that. It's a new Gallows folder, I think. So lose that. It probably threw it either on oh, my no, desktop no. or in the home drive. Oh, right. I'm running PDs. <laughs> 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 oh, look. Looks like I got all this good stuff. And now I don't know which of these is the one I just downloaded. Right there. <laughs> Let's get uh, maybe this one. Left hand side, left hand side. This must be it, right? I mean, this is the one I had to start with today. <laughs> Two of them. It's all right. This, I don't think it will hurt you to have more than one. And then you just do this. That's the easy part. And then maybe this will happen, maybe not. Uh, one thing I've noticed the first time you do this on any computer, sometimes it seems to take 30 seconds for PD to start up. So if you click it and it does nothing for 30 seconds, I don't know what that is, but that's Steve Jobs doing that for you. <laughs> yeah, he, well, can you do extended work? Yes. Oh, thank you. Right. There, another thing that you can do, which will be more fun, is go get PD extended as opposed to PD PD. In fact, so much fun, I'm going to do this for you, too. <laughs> uh, the problem is I've forgotten where you go. Oh, well, so we just do... Right, get into the browser, and then we say PD extended. PD extended pure data downloads PD community site November 20th. Yeah, that sounds good. I don't know what the difference is between that and that. All right. This is the redoubtable Hans Christoph Steiner, who is a person who uh, who aggregate, well, does many, many things for PD, including is actually spearheading uh, PD's release 43, but, uh, um, but he's also making these so-called PD extended installers. Uh, for those of you who know what's going on with PD and or Max, um, they have various kinds of objects in them. PD itself ships with a couple of hundred objects, and PD extended ships with a couple of thousand objects in it. 
So you have lots and lots and lots more stuff to play with in the extended if you can figure out where to find it. <laughs> and once in a while I actually reach, you know, I don't want to make a Butterworth filter. They've got Butterworth filters in there. So there are things which, you know, you care about which you can get in the extended that are sometimes really worth getting. The other thing about that is uh, when you want to make graphics, uh, PD has a, an extension called GEM, the graphics environment for multimedia, which will allow you to make graphics as well as, and also shoot video and, and analyze it and do, basically do with video kinds of things, the same things that PD will do with audio. It's not really part of this course, but PD Extended has that, and you can go make movies or whatever you want to do. I'll show you a little bit of that just as a teaser in week 10 when there's, you know, when the witching hour shows up. So, uh, PD Extended install. The last time I did this, it was very easy. So, I'm hoping this will still be true. Download home. Oh, so, it's going to download the 42. Okay. This is the, um, this is the one that works. Uh, PD Extended 43 is up there somewhere, too. Yeah? No? Okay. So, uh, if, you, if you want PD Extended in, in a fragile state, you can do that, too. But anyway, I think what I do is click this. And it says, go ahead and virtualize more applications. <laughs> then we will start shortly. Ah. Oh, yes, right. Now I'm open it with, I don't want to save it on out. Oh, it's a disk image. I'll just save it. All right. OK. All right. So now I'll say something <laughs> interesting for 38 seconds. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, actually, I sort of know this is going to work because I already have it on this computer. Uh, it worked the first time. And meanwhile, nothing will happen until I've done with this. So now I can do a little cleanup. Which one is that? <coughs> the, uh, That's the real step that means that you're doing computer music. And to do that, you or to find out whether that's happening, um, there are two places that you should think about looking. Um, I always go to the impatient place first. The impatient place is go to media and say test audio and MIDI. And up comes a PD patch. 
This is a PD document, first one you've seen so far, I guess. And this has indicators that say whether sound is coming into your computer. These are numbers in decibels, which you learned about in musical acoustic class quarter. Uh, these are in decibels with 100 being full blast. So what I'm looking at right now, I don't have a microphone, so this is the noise level on the audio input device of my computer. There's nothing plugged in. So I have a signal to noise ratio of, you can compute that in your heads. <laughs> Four minus. So the, so the loudest signal I could get would be 100 here. And I'm looking at 28. So signal to noise ratio is 100 minus 28, which is 72, which is not audio hardware, you should buy. <coughs> That's bad. Okay, now the other thing that you want to know okay, so sound, but sound is coming in. I like seeing that better than I like seeing zero. What I really like seeing is like one or two, which means I've got decent audio hardware. Uh, and now I can make sound, which is to say I can ask the test tone to go on. And this is in decibels too, again with, with 100 being full blast. So a good place to start is 60. And now you hear a nice 8, 4, 40. Or oh, here's 80. I always do 60 first because you never really know where the speakers are set. While I was, yeah, there it was. Now, what I didn't show you was, before most of you came in, I connected my computer to the audio system of this room, uh, along with the projector. So what you're hearing now is the computer's line output talking to my stereo. And any of you who has a stereo can do the same thing. And that's a better way, to, or that are headphones, it would be a better way to operate than using this, the little speakers that are on your computer. Yeah? Did you say the lower the number, the better? Number. The low, well, here, yeah. If there's nothing plugged in, the lower the number, the better. But if you have a laptop, your laptop might have a microphone. So you might not just be looking at the electrical noise level on your input device. You might actually be looking at the sound. Oh, okay. If that's the case, then when you say things, that number goes up. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, then you get a little happy because it means you've got audio in your dog and then you can start making cool yeah, that's right. processing patches. Um, I'll say that this will happen to you, the first audio processing patch you make will suffer from horrible feedback if you're using the microphone and speakers on the wall, like that. <laughs> because the mic is very close to the speaker, right? And so the sound comes out of the speaker and back through and things like that. But if you want to control that, plug in a pair of headphones, which usually will mute the microphones, and then you can listen to what it's doing and then the microphone will work properly, I think. Depends on, you know, your mileage, your mileage may vary and all that. All right. um, other thing, just telling you about this, oh, I want to just tell you the basics about getting sound out. So when you do this, and that happens, it's great, but it's possible to do this and not have the sound come out. And then there are things that you might want to do to, to figure out why, whether you have sound or not. Uh, and that all lives here, under PD. Okay, so this, so this window popped up when I said media, text audio and MIDI. And by the way, this would be, possible to do but not useful. I can have two of these up at once and they'll be fighting with each other. So don't do that. <laughs> um, okay, so in, and then in PD, so that was in media, right? That's the audio media. In PD you get preferences uh, which has ooh, which has audio settings. I'm not gonna talk about MIDI today. And audio settings are what sample rate we're running at and a magic number which I should tell you about and what audio devices and what numbers of channels. <clears throat> and now I can do things that will cause everything to break. Like, let's have eight channels of output. Right? Uh, uh, all of a sudden, nothing happens. <coughs> and maybe, I hope I have an error message. Oh, I have lots of error messages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't, didn't even give me a proper error message. You just can't do it. <laughs> So, th so this is the can't do it mode. You don't see anything here, and you don't hear anything coming out. That just means that your audio device didn't get open. And that could happen for all sorts of reasons, which are hard to disambiguate. But in that case, it was me asking for something impossible like that. Also, if I ask for, I don't know, megahertz out, I don't <laughs> think it's going to agree. Nah, can't do that. 
So you have to ask for something reasonable. And the standard CD sample rate is 44K1. Why is there no apply button? And now we're back to be happy to see it, but now I'm going to go. Okay. So, oh, the other thing that could go wrong is you could, oh, I can't make it not be happy right now. You, you can have this thing dialed in on a device that is no longer plugged into your computer. Like, you buy a USB audio device, you plug it in, you tell PD to use it, and then you unplug the device, it no longer exists, PD starts up, can't find it, and then you will, you'll see here just a little circle which, which has nothing in it, and you just have to click on that and then select the thing that you really want. Okay. Uh, oh, the other thing that I want to tell you is, this number here, the delay, this is the spooky setting that uh, matters, but which, uh, but which is hard to figure out how to deal with. Uh, this is a number which is 80 milliseconds or up if you're using Bill Gates software, or is 20 to 30 if you're using Bill, whatever his name is, Bill Jobs, is Steve Jobs, is thing. <laughs> <laughs> or you can get it down to about 10 on Linux. This is the this is the amount of time that passes between when sound comes into the machine and when it comes back out. And if you try to make this too low, PD should um, should uh, be showing you errors. Which I'll see if I can find. And you should hear that. get very low audio latencies if you buy professional audio hardware to put on there. So if you're a real gearhead and want to buy gear, then you can you can gear your way out of the problem. Although you can also just take this, <laughs> plug it into your machine and turn it into Linux. <laughs> which is what I would do. Alright. So we're running. Okay. So sorry to belabor all this, but this is important because you have only eight days to get this all, nine days to get this all happening and, and returning in homework. So I, I want to make this as painfully easy as possible. Questions about all this? I know I've forgotten things. Yeah. So what determines the um, like the latency? Is it like the latency? Are the delays like is it yeah. like between like Windows and Mac? Is it just like the hardware on it or is it like the processing speed? No, it's certainly not the hardware because. You can fix the problem just by loading Linux on the same hardware, typically. Uh, it's the... So... Hmm, yeah. I, I can't even generalize and tell you something that's really true in every possible case, but it's... But in some, in some sense, audio... Well, the audio systems consist of layers of stuff on top of stuff. And driver and then API and then, then PD itself. And they all have various amounts of buffering thing. Uh, buffering meaning the, the amount of memory that they allocate in order to deal with being on time with everything. So when you when you write something to a computer's audio output, 
you don't just write the next sample that has to go out. You write several or many milliseconds in advance so that the audio hardware can be throwing them out while you're off thinking about email or something. Uh, so that then when you get back to writing the next sample, you're still ahead of what it's doing. So there is a first in, first out buffer sitting in your audio output driver uh, and it's it's throwing stuff out here and you're preparing stuff for it to throw out and you're staying ahead. But you're stopping every once in a while because the OS is not treating you right and it's still reading. And then if it reads something before you wrote it, then you will hear badness. In fact you'll hear exactly this the kind of badness. In general you'll hear the sort of badness that I was just giving you. Why would one operating system or one uh, or one audio let's see, yeah, application programming interface require more buffering than another? You have to make enough buffering to deal with whatever your operating system can do for you in terms of calling you back uh, in, in, in short periods of time, and that depends on the OS. But uh, but also, different writers of, of audio software are sometimes more or less conservative in the way they design these things. So in truth, Windows is over-designed. It, it, could, it could be a, a great deal racier. You know, maybe one time in a million it would fail. And they can't fail one time in a million because they'll get phone calls. So they just make the buffer real long so the phone doesn't work. OK. So there's that. Um, yeah. Now I can start doing stuff, I think. Other questions? Before I actually start doing stuff. No. Okay. So do do please before Thursday get this get this downloaded and running so that so that you're not discovering that you can't figure out how to do it over the next week or something. All right. So next thing is this. Uh, what is this thing good for? Um, so <coughs> yeah. So what I'm going to do is, go, is make a patch that makes a sound, and then I'm going to go back and do some theory. <coughs> Um, simply because I think it might be better to see the thing happen first and then make the theory after. Uh, so what I'm doing also is I'm simultaneously, surreptitiously teaching you how to use pure data, but, uh, but the real content of the course isn't pure data, it's, it's the technique of audio synthesis and processing and analysis, which in fact you can do in, in software packages other than PD. And if you want to know about, well, if you want to know about lots of possible software packages, I know them all, so I can tell you all sorts of stuff you can do with a computer in, in some other context. So, uh, let's see, font. I'm going to just select a ridiculous font to start with. And um, the basic thing you do is you put stuff on the screen, so there's this nice menu item to put. And um, what I'm going to do today is going to be limited to two kinds of things that you can put down. One is going to be objects. Of course, that really means 200 different things because I have to type in what kind of object it's going to be. So that's going to, that's going to be where I live most of the time. The other thing is I'm going to need a button later on. Okay, so first off, I'm going to make an object. And it shows up, and I can, oh, OK, now here's the. Here's the thing, this, is, this has a dotted outline that says that there's nobody in there right now. And in fact, if I tell it, uh, let's, let's be some object that doesn't exist, it'll still say, nah, there's nobody there. And in fact, it even got mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, now I'll just ask it to do something that it knows how to do. There's an oscillator, and oscillators take as an argument. Uh, check this. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to ask it to play A. So you've had musical acoustics, and you all know that 440 hertz is A above middle C. Okay, that's one of those physical constants on the speed of light that people just don't touch. Right? You, just, you just have that. Right? OK, now we're going to say, what, uh, what amplitude do we want? Okay. So I'm going to put another object. I'm doing this the slow way now. I'll show you the fast way later. <coughs> put another object and put it down here. And then I'm going to type times. Oh, times tilde, I should say. And I'm going to ask it, let's only be a tenth of a whole blast sine wave. OK, I'm going, to get, I'm going to crack the book in a moment and show you in waveforms what we're talking about here. But 
uh, but for right now, just talking over this, this is putting out a full blast 440 hertz sine wave. Oh, and by the way, you might know this intuitively, but the, uh, these things are inputs up here. And this is an output, and I'm going to hook the output of the oscillator to the input of time is 0.1. And what that is going to do is it's going to take the amplitude of this and reduce it from full blast to a tenth of full blast. What's full blast? Get there. And then I'm going to say, put another object, and this one is going to be, this is kind of not well named, it's going to be the digital to analog converter. That's the person in your computer who takes those numbers and turns them into voltages. Okay. And now I'm going to say, oh wow, it just worked. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, take the output of this thing and put it in this B, or that's to say, put it, make it available to the audio output of my computer, which, by the way, is connected to the speaker. Okay. Now, how do I make it shut up? Uh, there's this control here, which says whether you're doing, whether you're That's the fastest way to get silence if something's happening too loud. And that's important, so there's a key accelerator. The, the slash turns it on and the period turns it off. Oh, command slash is on and command period is off, which you can think of as sort of a mute. It's not really a mute, but maybe we'll that way for now. Alright. Now, the other thing that I should have mentioned is that when you start PD, this thing is turned off. Uh, the reason it was on just now is not because I surreptitiously turned it on, but because the test tone, which I've already had out, automatically turns DSP on as a, so that it can make noise. And as a result, I was using the fact that DSP was still running even though I had closed the test tone. So this, this thing stays on or off regardless of whether I have patches open or shut. I can close this patch and it won't change the status of whether the DSP is running or not. So this is more software than more, well this is sort of half software and half theory now. DSP running, what that means is every object whose name ends in a tilde, if DSP is running, is computing 44,100 numbers per second, or a number of numbers per second equal to the sample rate, I should say, but 44K1 right now. And what that means is that when this is turned on, this output contains a stream of, of numbers, uh, one every 44,100 of a second, say one every 22 microseconds. All right. And furthermore, each one of these things is doing that. It's using all of its inputs. It's, it's, it's receiving inputs at the same rate. If, if, there, if nothing is connected to one of these inputs, the input is That's a complexity. If nothing is, is, com is coming to an input that expects audio, the input is zero. I, I'm, I'm going to have to repeat in several different ways distinctions between these streams of audio and things which happen in sporadic, uh, happen sporadically, which can sometimes be called control or not audio. Uh, but what you're seeing right now is connections between the audio output of the oscillator and the audio input of this multiplier. And what you have to know is that this input expects audio and this input expects not audio. It expects messages, which I will tell you about later. All right, so this network is network. As I say, these, these connections are, if you like, carrying numbers when <coughs> it's turned on and they're not carrying numbers when it's turned off. And this, this input actually does expect an audio, uh, expects an audio signal. And so, for instance, if I have this on, I can break this. Oh, to, to cut a connection, select the connection which turns it blue, and then hit Command X, I guess, to cut. So, I want to try the other output.
what's the ratio between those two numbers? Three to two, and that's what interval on the piano or music is scale. selects the objects, and then you can move things, right? Am I going too slow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. all right. <laughs> okay, so uh, also you can select a single thing as a, as a group using the group selector thing, and again, it just select it as a selection, right? Okay, the next thing is this. I want to show you what this actually really is. And to do that, I have to introduce two new objects. The, oh, and while I'm at it, I'm going to tell you, there's, of course, a key accelerator for putting an object, and it's command one. And then I can say print. This is <coughs> object number four. So I believe in the first week, you're going to see about 10 kinds of objects. What I try to do is, is limit it to like five a day. First day is going to be iffy, but because we're already up to four. But uh, but theoretically, we will not be learning lots of objects all at once, but they will be coming out at a steady rate. So right now, we've seen the oscillator OSC tilde, we've seen the multiplier, we've seen the output, and now we've seen print tilde. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what the oscillator is doing by hooking it up to the print. Now, logically, you would err. The first uh, thing that you would expect this to do would be to print out 44,100 numbers a second, but it turns out that that would choke any, any computer in the world to try to print that stuff. Plus, you wouldn't want to see it. So instead of doing that, what it does is it waits until you tell it to please print the next glob of data. And it prints it globs at a time. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put the bang object, which is a button. Oh, let me do that slower. So put, I sh I've been putting objects, but I'm going to put this thing down now. Um, and it is a thing which, and now I have to let out more of the truth. Okay? I'm being very careful, trying to let out bits of truth very slowly. So see now that, the, that this line that I connected is only one pixel wide instead of two pixels wide, the way this one is. In other words, this is a nice dark, but these are nice dark lines here, but this is a lighter line. That is to tell you that this is not carrying an audio signal, but is for control. It's for sending messages. Messages are things which happen at specific times, as opposed to signals or audio signals, which are happening continuously. 
and the message that this thing sends out is every time you click on it, and well, every for now, every time you click on it, out comes a message, and the message just tells them to do their thing. In this case, it says, do your print. Oh, because I have this turned off. Now it prints out. but I don't want to teach you how to do that yet because there's too much detail involved. So I'm just going to try data set machina. And you know, where was I? I <coughs> don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. Yeah. All right, good. So this, uh, okay, so I told you there's a textbook. This is the textbook. Uh, you can buy this if you want to spend, I think it's $79. And they did a good job of printing it. But you don't need to buy it because you can just look at it on the web, which is more convenient. If you want to read it in a hammock, you can buy it. You can spend $80 and buy it or print it out. But don't tell them I told you to print it out. And here, um, oh, I'm skipping some stuff, uh, which is, which maybe I should go back to. But here is a picture of what a, a digitized audio sample looks like in, in, in graph language. Um, there are two pictures here because this is what you, this is what you want in some sense. Uh, what you want to make the speaker come do is move like that. Uh, the speaker comes live in continuous time. The time isn't split up into, into tranches of, of 22 microseconds a hit. So <coughs> the computer's representation of this, however, is split up in discrete time and therefore can graph it look something like that. This audio signal has a frequency and an amplitude. This is, um, this is in fact exactly what would come out if you gave the right, the appropriate frequency to an OSC tilde object. It varies between positive one and negative one. And that is an, uh, that has no units. That's an arbitrary, well, so that's, it's in an arbitrary scale. But I should tell you that if you put something that's more than one or less than minus one, your audio output, as to say, if you feed something that's out of that range to DAC tilde, then your computer will not be able to play it correctly. It will click. So this is the full audio range of, of your computer's audio output. How does PD know that? Uh, PD just asks the computer, what, what range do you want me to feed your DAC? And it normalizes that to one. All right. The frequency that you would do this at is manifested in how many of these samples it takes for the thing to make an entire cycle. This is all acoustic, right? And in fact, what this is, if you say, if you give it as an equation, is one of these things 
it's an amplitude times the cosine, you can use sine, but I'm using cosine here, of the frequency times the sample number plus a phase. So if you take one of these things and graph it, you will see something like what you saw graphed down there. Furthermore, you can change the numbers A, which is the amplitude, or omega, which is the frequency, or phi, which is the initial phase, and it, and it will change the way the thing looks in one way or another. N is the sample number, and so that is the horizontal axis here. Right? I'm insulting the intelligence of now, right? This is all it is, though. You know? All you do is you do this, except you change that equation, and you get all of computer music. I've been doing this for 30 years. <laughs> and it never gets old. Either. Okay, so, so what is omega here? Well, omega was enough so that after, I think, 20 samples, if I'm counting right, uh, the thing comes around um, to a cycle. So omega is 2 pi over 20. Omega is the which was the frequency up there. Right? So it is the number of the sample. And this is a thing which controls the frequency, but, it, but it's the physical frequency of the thing as, a, as an array of numbers. It's not the heard frequency. And you can convert that to the frequency frequency by a simple formula. Ta-da. The frequency you hear is the omega, is the, the angular frequency is what that's called, times the sample rate divided by two pi. And that's how you make a sinusoid. So if you want it to, oh, right. So if you want it to be louder, change A, or, and here's why I'm going back to her. For this, I have to go back to the patch. If, you, if someone gives you a sinusoid and if you don't want to change its amplitude, all you have to do is multiply it by the ratio of the two amplitudes. In other words, multiply it by the gain that you want, with gain meaning the difference between the two amplitudes. So what that means is, what comes out of this, what is coming out of, uh, let's see, let's see this equation, and then the patch. Ah. What's coming out of this oscillator right now, omega is, this, um, no, omega is 2 pi times 440 divided by 44,100, whatever that number is. And A is 1. The amplitude of, of the output of this thing is 1. And so what this is really putting out is the cosine of omega times N, and then forget the phase for now, because time's been passing and we don't know what the phase is right now. Okay. But if we want to change this amplitude, if I gave you just cosine and omega n, and <coughs> if, if you said, no, I want 0.1 times the cosine of omega, in other words, I want something with an amplitude of 0.1 instead of 1, then you, the solution is to multiply the thing by 0.1. And that multiplies it this way, changes the amplitude. It doesn't do this. That would be, yeah. So if you ran uh, your print command like through oscillators instead of just having them separate, would, would that, instead of going all the way up to 1 and down to negative 1, would it just go up to point 0.1 and down to negative point 0.1? Yeah, thank you, because I actually, I, I meant to do that. So I think what you're asking is, what if I just print the, what if I just print the output of this, right? Right. Yeah, okay, good. So we'll do that. And I forgot to turn, oh, so nothing happened because audio is turned off. So I'll turn audio on and it will say, oh, I have to print something. Yep. And now what we see is, it's kind of ugly. I'm sorry, the spaces aren't worked right. But what you see is something that's going up to about 0.1. And there's 0.9998 instead of 1. So these numbers are these numbers divided by 10. Except that I asked it at a different time, and so actually they, they're like them, but they're not exactly the same as it's like some of the things. All right. Is that all clear? Okay. Now, without anything besides those things, can I... Oh, yeah, let me do this too. <coughs> so, I'm, I'm 
I'm going, to, I'm going to raise the total count of objects to five, but not in a very interesting way. I just need an adder. So now what I'm going to do, oh, my shit. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the oscillator and have it be 0 plus 440. Now we're going to check if that's the same thing. Yeah. Okay, so this is stupid. There's, there's 0 coming in here, and we're adding 440. So what comes out of here is 440 volts. Uh, if, if this were an analog synthesizer, 440 volt signal. The oscillator then is giving us a signal that's plus or minus 1 volt, but it's changing 440 times a second. And now what I, what, the reason I did that was so that I can do this. Let's take another oscillator, get another oscillator. Oh, I'm doing this without telling you what I'm doing. Um, okay, I'm selecting this object without selecting the text, and I'm hitting Command D, which duplicates it. And, then, and it duplicates it and leaves it selected without the text selected, so now it's very convenient for me to move it. This one I'm going to say 6. And by the way, I can change its amplitude too. Looking at this in a weird perspective. Come on. Right. And yeah, by the way, let's multiply that by something. No, it's not yet. Let's just do it. Let's see what we get. Anyone want to guess what this is going to sound like? All right, I'll show you. varies from 339 to 441. And that variation repeats six times per second because this thing is happening at six cycles per second. But, in fact, to make this an easier thing to hear, I could say, let's multiply that by five. It's going to be this will be quite audible. Okay, and now I'm going to say, go. Oh, it's not quite as ugly as I wanted it to be. Okay, so now we're varying between 300, sorry, 435 and 445 hertz. And now, of course, since it's a computer, you can tell it to do anything you want. It's really exciting. It's like it's doing two pitches at once. But I'm, I'm in a weird place because I'm getting an echo from there. Maybe it sounds like it's going to be okay. Or, you know, I'm going to say that for
space is the delimiter. That's in fact is is the only essentially the only delimiter that you have to deal with. Okay. So oh yeah. So don't try to make an object whose name has a space in it. And furthermore, if you yeah. So just a question about the, the setup. So the amplitude for the OSC tilde is one, right? Right. But we're, and we're times it by thirty. Right. So that makes the the amplitude for the four forty between four ten and four seventy. Is that right? Right. Okay. And that's changing three times a second. And then that's becoming the frequency from your oscillator. Ah. So I I didn't tell you something important. Frequently, objects will give you the choice of specifying their input or connecting to their input to set it. And here, I've said oscillator, which means we're just going to take a signal and just specify what our frequency is going to be. But here I'm saying oscillator, but I know what the frequency is. It's three, so I'm just going to keep it in. There are other, there's another way to weigh in, too, which is that you can change it using messages, but I'm not going to try to tell you that today. Yeah. Is there a map with all the names of the objects in the art? Uh, if you really want to see it, you say help. Uh, oh, yeah, right. Help. You should. Thank you. Help. <laughs> what does that say you really do? Right click on it, and then you can see if you get help. And help will open a patch, which has to be completely <laughs> which tells you everything you want to know about it. <laughs> okay, so that was help. So if you want to know what multipliers do, you do that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, and then if you right-click on the canvas and say help, the canvas meaning the document, but not any of the objects in the document, then you will get this lovely patch that someone else made. It will tell you everything in this very carefully organized order. But this will only be the first 200 objects, which are the ones that you get before you ask to be extended. That's more than one. Well, oh, that's a bunch of I'm not I didn't, I didn't see any specific examples, but I'm just about sure there are two copies of this thing here. Sorry, there really is this much stuff. Well, sorry, that's just what it is. Maybe there are more than 200 objects now. Okay, so that will tell you everything that you might need to know. And if we're doing 10 a week, at the end of 10 weeks, you'll know 100 of those objects. Now, you don't need to know them all. Uh, I know them all. But you're not being And basically, with, with about 100 of them, you can do a whole lot of stuff. And then there will be occasional things that you can't do with those 100 that will require that you find another one out and learn about it. So what happens is there will be a period of intense learning objects, like 10 a week. And then after a while, you won't need 10 new objects a week anymore. And things will calm down. OK, other questions? Yeah. How do you get the print print to work again? Oh, uh, okay, so, oh, yeah, so there's a, there's a thing I didn't tell you which is fundamental. The, <laughs> the patch can be in two different, sorry, the, the interface to the patch can be in two different states, which are sometimes called run mode or edit mode. If I try to click this thing now, I'm just editing the patch, and that doesn't click on it, it just moves it, right? So. What I have to do is, turn, is put myself into run mode, which I do here. Let's get out of edit mode. Now, edit mode is no longer worse. Well, it's version 43. You, can you get what you pay for. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the, the indication is what the cursor looks like. So right now what you see is an arrow. And if I do that again, you will see a arrow again. Okay, now it's just being happy. Right? You cannot get out of it, but that's cool. Okay, well, I'm expecting to see stuff like this because we're in pre release. Does the shortcut work, Apple? Yeah. Oh, the shortcut works great. So the shortcut, uh, uh, you just hit ESP, uh, Command E, or Apple E. 
and then it goes back and forth between modes, except that, and this is a, <laughs> this is a thing that Hans has driven, has torn hair out of his head over. Um, you don't actually see the new state until you move the cursor, because some smart person in Apple thought that you would never have the cursor change unless you reached it, you know, unless you change where the cursor is. So, so what you have to do is change the mode, but then you have to jiggle the cursor to see that you're in the other mode. <laughs> Isn't that horrible? That's only on Macintosh. <laughs> so only 80% of you are going to have this trouble. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyway, when you're in the so you know, so just move it to make sure it's, it's what you think it is. And anyway, when you're in the run mode, which is not edit mode, then you can click this thing and get it to do its thing. And of course, sorry, we also have to be doing audio before it gets a bit. Oh, but of course there's a reason I'm not on audio. Let's um, Let's just do this. So now we can turn the thing on, but not hear it. And now we're running, so I can do this and let it go. But if I get back into edit mode like this, then I can click it all I want and it's not going to help. Although some, sometimes, oh yeah, you can, you can hold the command key down and click. And it will say, it's as if you were in run mode for just a minute. So, so the command key operates as a, as a sort of a shift into run mode thing, if you can remember that. I never remember it, so I just toggle the mode. Other questions? Did that answer your ears? Okay. Yeah? Um, just want to make sure I understand print and uh, back to the print. If you're in run mode and you click it, it creates a graphical mathematical representation of that patch, is that right? Well, not even graphical, just prints the numbers out on the output. Right. And then the DAC tilde, Okay, so the DAC tilde, that takes whatever the signal is and it puts it there. So, 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 it causes, so it causes it to appear as audio output. So this is print the values out so I can see them, and this is play them so I can hear them. Is that a review for something? DAC, it's a digital to analog converter. Mm -hmm. And that used to be what people called it. There actually is a DAC in your machine, but people have never seem to use that term anymore. So, yeah. yeah. It only prints the first 64, though. It only prints the next 64, but okay. you whack it. Well, yeah. Of course, if you really wanted to, no, no, no. <laughs> I, could, I could ask it to print more, and then I would see it in terms of stuff. But I don't do that just yet. Yeah. Do you have a limit in the inputs and outputs? You mean, uh, as to amplitude or the number of numbers or just how many things you can add? Oh, no. You can add more inputs to an object? Yeah. Oh, wait. Uh, add more inputs to an object, meaning I think what your question was was how many other things could I run into this into right. these it's fixed objects? Right? Oh, so I can add that and you never have to stop. But could I have the could I make the object itself have more inputs? Each object has its own semantics about what its inputs and outputs mean. Some of them actually do have variable numbers. But you won't see those for a couple of weeks. Other questions? These are good questions, by the way. Yeah. You said that the right input was like an input for messages. So if you try to put an input like of an audio to that, it won't work. Yeah. You have to keep it to the left. Right. Yeah. So, so for these particular objects, okay, those the, the right input is. Yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll get there because there will be other things where there will be more than one audio input. Because uh, sometimes you want to multiply two audio signals or something like that. And I'm scared to tell you that right now. I'll tell you that on <laughs> Thursday. Is this on like one channel right now? Like the left side? I've only been using the left side mostly. Yeah. Uh, when I'm working at home, I use both things because it irritates me to hear every sound out from just one side of the thing. <laughs> Much like, yeah. So then, there's no spaces unless you're putting a number in there. You just have a space to put a number. Right. Because otherwise, it just gives a dollar. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if I do, so if I, you know, one way I can have it fail is to add a space where I didn't want it. So they would look for an object named OSC and didn't see one. And the other thing that I could do would be wrong would be not to put space there because it would look for an object named OSC until the three, which doesn't exist anymore. So. The, are there so, defaults if you don't put a number in there? Yeah, zero. Well, so, <laughs> Which, well, yeah, you could add zero to something, it would help you. Multiply by zero, there would be other ways of getting that number. 
Um, but but there will be. But if you don't fill that number in, then the other end becomes an audio in there. and then you can make, and then you can run an audio signal in instead. I wasn't going to tell you that. But. So here, if I if, if I want to just multiply by something else, then I just don't say what multiplies by, and this thing then becomes an audio in. But then, then you can be multiplying two audio signals. That's really for next time, but that's a thing you can do. Yeah, I have a question. Um, why does the print object not have two inlets? Like, why are you going just to put them down this way? Yeah, that's stupid. <laughs> okay, so right. So, so objects have so inputs to objects have, can have various functionalities, and one of the particular things that you can send an input is an audio signal. But there are other things that you can send an audio signal input as well. Of course, if the thing had two different audio signal inputs, then you would have to have two different inlets in order to be able to disambiguate them. But if it takes two things that are different, like like a message and an audio signal, then you could get away with using the same inlet. And it was it was you know fewer it was less clutter on the screen to just combine them. That, that's the simple answer. <laughs> other questions? All right. Go look at the homework assignment. I don't know if my machine is going to be able to play it, but it's going to be to do this. Firefox, uh, uh, bookmarked it, um, and somewhere down here, you get your assignment here, which is to do this. Now, I don't know if this is going to play correctly, so. It's lame. Oh, it's really, all it is is just a musical fourth that gets louder and softer. And all it's, it's checking whether you can control amplitudes and frequencies and understand the difference between them. And it's checking whether you can actually get around the oscillator and the multiplier and the adder. And that's for, basically, basically what this amounts to is understanding, understanding oscillators and frequencies and amplitudes and being able to kick PD on, which is probably going to be the hard part. <laughs> but when we turn the homework in, turn the Oh, to turn the homework in, turn just upload the patch you made, oh. and I will give you more details about what the patch, how the patch should act in order to preserve the TA sanity. <laughs> there should be a clear way to turn it on. That's sort of the you know. But uh, more about that. Next time.